I'm not sure if I'm Norwegian anymore or whether I'm Australian or what I am after a while you're going to lose your identity, which is one of the kind of ideas of the Buddhist path, yeah? And I think one of the, there's so many different identities that we have, but obviously national identity is one of them. Uh, and you see how bad it actually is. You see it with a lot of the violence you see now in places like Sri Lanka, uh, you know, you see the uh, problems in Burma. Uh, even for Buddhists there's a problem and it comes from the idea of national identity is a very, I think, important driver of that violence and the clash you have between different cultures, the Islamic culture versus the Buddhist culture. So it actually is a big problem. Uh, so, you know, if you lose a bit of your identity, it probably is a good thing, you know, that's what I reckon. <laughs> so uh, that's my background. Uh, uh, that's where I come from, and I uh, started out my monastic life in the UK, in Amravati Monastery, Chitras Monastery, Adan Sumedho's Monastery so in the UK. And uh, then I heard a talk by Ajahn Brahma, and I said, this is my teacher. So I came to Australia straight away. Yeah. And I've been there ever since. I've been a monk here now. I've been staying in this monastery now for 20, over 23 years, so close to 24 years. So. And uh, that was the best move of my life, I think. It was just the right thing that I did. I, sometimes it's like you have, I think it has to do with your, uh, it's not, you know, not just about recognizing the right teaching, but it's about sometimes you have a kind of um, chemistry with somebody else. It's like your, your, your outlook is somehow similar, so it's easy to kind of, you know, work with them. And for me, I always felt I had a very good chemistry with someone like Ajahn Brahma. And I also find him very inspiring in terms of Dhamma qualities. Yeah, I see Dhamma qualities in him that I think are quite rare actually in the world to find in almost anyone. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, why I stay here. Uh, so I started off in the UK, but I, I actually began before that. You know, it's one of those interesting things in, the, in life. It's always about why do you end up as a Buddhist monk? Uh, and it, in, in one way, it's really hard to explain. You grow up in a country where there's hardly any Buddhism at all. I didn't know any Buddhists. My parents certainly weren't Buddhists, yeah. But there was something inside of me which, you know, which kind of drew me in that direction. Uh, and I remember when I was 12 years old, I had this fantasy about living in a hut in the forest by myself. Yeah, 12 years old. I mean, <laughs> what's going on there? It, and it's very interesting. Yeah. And uh, I think in retrospect, the only way I can really explain that kind of natural inclination towards Asian uh, religions, towards meditation, all these things, uh, is really that it must come from a past life. I can't really understand any other way where it comes from. Uh. So that is the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, people are kind of disappointed. Surely you saw the superiority of the Buddhist teaching and you became a Buddhist. Uh, but it isn't, it isn't like that. Life doesn't work like that. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter. It's not about intelligence. It's often about emotions that drive us. And if you have a natural feeling for something, you just go there. Uh, we are emotional beings. And the Buddha says so. Uh, Vedana Pachaya Tanha. Vedana is not exactly the same as emotion, but very closely related to that. Uh, and that is what drives you forward in life, drives you to do things. Uh, that is, I think, one of the most essential things. So, so you, that is what kind of gets you started on the Buddhist path. Uh, but then what actually keeps you there and what kind of keeps you going is often something very different. And what keeps you there is uh, uh, once you start reading the word of the Buddha, you start to understand what it is all about. And one of the things that kind of became clear to me after a while was that this is the answer to the meaning of life. That's what became clear to me. Uh, and once you get, once you kind of, uh, once that is your outlook, that you think this is the answer to the meaning of life, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, are you going to do something else? Uh, <laughs> you can't do anything else. Yeah? I mean, what if you found the meaning of life, why are you going to kind of go and get married and get a job somewhere? Why are you going to kind of do, do whatever else in life? If you found the meaning, there's only one uh, conclusion from that, and that is that you commit yourself to that. Uh, there's no other, no other possibility, really. Uh, that was kind of, this is the feeling I have had for the last, I don't know, 15 years or whatever. Uh, this really is the answer to the meaning of life. Now it's just a matter of applying myself. Uh, and that, I think, is the second thing that makes you remain as a monastic in the long term. You see that you think that you have found the meaning of life, you apply yourself, and you see that the path actually works. How do you know that the path works? Well, you know that the path works, and this is actually, Buddha says this in the suttas as well, how you actually know these things. Uh, you look inside of yourself, are your good qualities improving? Uh, if they are, it's working. Are your bad qualities declining? Uh, if they are, it, it, it is working. Uh, more mindfulness, uh, more kindness, uh, more samadhi, uh, yeah? a bit more wisdom, at least a little bit. Uh, it takes a while before wisdom really takes off. Uh, 
a reduction in kind of negative things. Yeah, less anger, more equanimity of mind, more kind of coolness uh, in, in these things. Uh, and this is what I have seen continuously over, over you know, pretty much since I became a monastic. Uh, and uh, you know that if this continues, uh, there's only one goal. Uh, it only goes in one direction, uh, and that is ultimately towards Nirvana. What really matters in Buddhism is the Dhamma. The Dhamma is primary. The Vinaya arises from the Dhamma. And you see that, you know, that in the beginning of the um, uh, Vinaya, Pitaka, uh, in the Sutta Vibhanga, the Buddha talks about well, how, how the Vinaya arises. Uh, and when Sariputta goes to him and says, please lay down the Vinaya rules so the Sasana can last a long time. Yeah, you know that story, yeah? And the Buddha says, I only lay down the rules once certain defilement, certain asavas arise in the community, then I lay down the rules. And the whole Vinaya is based on this idea that there is a problem that needs to be solved. And then you, 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 uh, you kind of lay down a rule to counter that. But the Dhamma was already in place. Lay people can also, at the right time and right place, they can say something. Yeah. They can say, oh, Bante, why are you eating? Oh, isn't there a rule about this? You know, hint, hint. Not kind of push too hard, yeah. because again, that's not the black fire, but maybe kind of give a hint. You know, we saw these other monks, they didn't eat after. How come there is a difference here? <coughs> yeah. Hint, hint, yeah. And something very gentle, but very, very kind of. Uh, uh, because I think one of the important things to realize is that the reason why monks often break their rules is because they are used to that from the environment, they're used to that from their own teachers. It's not because they choose to be bad, it's that they have been conditioned into bad ways of doing things. And once you realize, you can have a bit of compassion for them, you know, they're not really evil or bad or anything like that, it's just that this is how they've been conditioned. So recognizing that, then you tend to be also more gentle with them if you want to, you know, try to change, change their ways. So this is the, uh, the first thing, is to kind of just, um, uh, you know, try, try to see, see if they change. Uh, and uh, the second thing is to, I think, it is always the right thing. If you want to support the monastic order, uh, give the most support to where you have the most faith, uh, to where you feel the practice is kind of taken to the highest level. Uh, that is where it's best to give the most support. Uh, why? Well, because that is where the results are going to come. If you're going to be able to sustain Buddhism for the future, what we need is areas. We need noble ones who actually understand these teachings. Where is that going to happen? It's going to happen where the vinya is taken seriously, where meditation is happening, where the path is practiced fully. That's where it's going to happen. So if you want to preserve Buddhism for the future, you should also ensure that you support those monastics who are taking this to the highest potential. And remember, it doesn't have to be just monks, it can also be nuns. Nuns have the same potential as monks to gain enlightenment if they practice well. So better to, to support a good nun than, than to support a dodgy monk, yeah? People often forget that, but that actually is, an, I think, an important point. One of the things that I always remember, I, I, I love the, uh, in many ways, the Mahapanibbana Sutta. There's so many beautiful teachings in there. And also some of the teachings in there that tend to, the Buddha tends to summarize what his um, Dhamma is all about, and it tends to give advice about the future, how the monastic order should, you know, practice to enable the Dhamma to live for a long time into the future, all these kind of things. So very many interesting teachings in there. And one of the teachings is the seven factors that lead to non-decline. And uh, one of those seven factors is that the Dhamma uh, will grow and not decline as long as the monastics delight in forest lodgings. Yeah, It's one of seven factors, for goodness sake, for why the Dhamma lasts into the future. So it's actually not just a small issue, it's actually a very, very big issue uh, that you have people who take the Dhamma seriously, practice according to the rules, live in the forest. Uh, that's actually another of the seven factors is that as monastics you don't uh, abolish any of the existing rules, you don't make new ones, and you practice according to the existing rules. The other world is very large, we're just one little monastery. Okay, Ajahn Brahm is very famous, that's true, but uh, very often what happens is that while he's famous, you know, then everything is kind of going really well here. But one day he's going to die, what then? Uh, of course, if we have some other monks who then kind of live up to his standards, can kind of carry that on onwards into the future, uh, then maybe it can become a force that kind of, you know, becomes more widespread in the Theravada world. Uh, but uh, the Theravada world is conservative, uh, it is not going to change easily. Uh, uh, and uh, I, uh, 
uh, the, the arguments that people use, the winner arguments that people use are very uh, settled. You know, I've seen some of those arguments, very settled arguments. I don't think that they uh, you need to look at things that way. But the problem is that the vinaya, yeah, you, can, you can take many different angles of viewpoint how you look at the vinaya. Yeah. You can take a conservative angle, you can take a more liberal angle to these things. Uh, and what decides the angle uh, that you take is often your values that come beforehand. Uh, yeah? Is bi bi ordination of bhikkhunis, is that acceptable according to the vinaya? Yeah? And I say it is. Uh, and I have you know, been working with Venerable Anale a lot on these issues. Uh, I've seen all the arguments, and I, I think it is. Uh, but you can also, if you look at it from a different angle, you can also argue that it's not. Uh, yeah? So which do you choose? Uh, and what, the one you choose is going to be the one which is kind of your pre-existing values. Is it important to have bhikkhunis in the modern world? Uh, I think it's incredibly important. I think it's absolutely essential. I think as Buddhists, are we, if you're going to be taken seriously in the modern world, we have to have that sense of equality between men and women. Otherwise, people are going to write us off as some kind of throwback to the Neanderthal past or something like that. When you look at you know, the, uh, the number of uh, good monastics in the world, the number of good monks in the world is quite small. Uh, if we can fortify that with some good nuns who can also take part in teaching and inspiring people, etc., uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. So I hope maybe some of the things that we do here will rub off and carry on you know, and kind of become mainstream in, in Theravada Buddhism. We are going, I think we will always be uh, doing our very best to persuade others that, that this is the right thing to do with bhikkhunis in particular. Yeah. And we are not going to give up until we breathe our last breath, I, I, I think. Yeah. So I would uh, uh, you know, tell the little people, you know, uh, you know, support where your heart, according to your heart. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, don't be kind of be too afraid of having to be conservative always. Uh, uh, if you feel that something is right, uh, especially when your mind is clear, when you have no defilements in your heart, and you feel something is right, uh, then very often that will be the right thing to do. Huh? So, Bante, how are the local bikinis behaving? Are they behaving well? <laughs> Yeah, the, lo the local Bikinis. Well, the local Bikinis, they, that is the uh, Damasara Bikinis, Damasara monastery that we have here. I think there are about 10 Bikinis there, a few seminaries, and they're expanding very fast. Uh, there's a lot of interest in ordaining as Bikinis over here. Very high quality Bikinis, they're all very highly educated. Uh, they all kind of have PhDs and, and all kind of stuff, you know. They're also very, uh, some of them are very good meditators as well, get very good results in the meditation practice. Uh, uh, they are they're still a young community, so they're still kind of learning a lot, uh, you know, because the Bikkuni Vinaya is almost like a carte blanche. Nobody knows much about the Bikkuni Vinaya because nobody's practiced it for over a thousand years. Uh, so they have to start very much from scratch. Uh, and I have tried to help them a little bit because I, ha I obviously have a little bit of basic understanding about the Vinaya in general, so you can apply that to the Bikkuni Vinaya as well. Uh, but generally speaking, their um, attitude is very good. They're very good candidates, intelligent. Um, uh, very committed to the Dhamma, getting good results in their practice. I must admit, I'm very impressed. And if this continues, and we continue to get candidates like that coming through, the Bikini Sangha certainly here is going to become very, very powerful and very strong. Yeah. And I think we, uh, it won't be long before our Buddhinana Monas is overshadowed. <laughs> we get maybe, maybe the, I mean, you know, things, things develop, yeah, and things change over time. So it is uh, not at all impossible that, you know, who knows, 20, 30 years down the track, that you may get a completely different situation here. Yeah, the Vinaya is a large, large number of rules uh, in terms of kind of etiquette and all kind of things. It's certainly part of that. And, but there's actually something else which is even much more important than that, and that is how the community functions together. That's even more important. Uh, and this is what you call, we call Sangha Kama uh, in, in the Pali. Sangha means like literally action of the, of the Sangha, of the order, of the monastic order. Uh, so this is how we uh, come together, how we decide who is going to ordain, how we kind of do the opposite ceremony together, the observation ceremony together. Uh, if we appoint someone as an officer of the Sangha to be in charge of the stores, for example, you do that through a Sangha Kama, an official act of the Sangha. Uh, uh, and this is, to me, in some ways, it's even more interesting than the other part of the Vinaya. Because the other part of the Vinaya, okay, after a while, it becomes almost second nature. You know what you have to do. Huh? And you know that basically, if you are if you have a good heart, if you're kind, you can never really go that far, far off the Vinaya. Yeah? I mean, it is really, in the end, it's about kindness and good heartedness. That's what it really is about. Uh, uh, but this other thing, it um, ensures that uh, 
uh, the, the Sangha makes decisions that have integrity to them, uh, that everybody agrees to. Uh, the two basic principles of Sangha Karma, of the, of the actions done by the Sangha, is uh, on the one hand that it is a de pure democratic decision, it's absolute democracy, everybody has to agree. If you have one monk who says nay, then it can, can't go through. Yeah? So it's an absolute democracy. In some ways, it's much more democratic than modern modern democratic institutions around the world because uh, everybody has to agree. And there's something very beautiful about that because when everybody has to agree, it means nobody is left out. Uh, in a traditional demo democracy, you can have the tyranny of the majority. Yeah? The majority oppresses the minority, uh, which sometimes can happen. Uh, uh, and if you look at history, I think some of that has exactly, exactly what has happened. Uh, you, 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 kind of, you install some kind of despot through democratic means, and then kind of you get the tyranny of the majority, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but if everybody is on board, it means that you have to take into account everybody's feelings, everybody's ideas. You have to listen to them. Okay, how can we f resolve this in a way where everybody is satisfied? It's very good, yeah. It means that um, it means that nobody really feels left out at the end of the day. Everybody feels that they have been heard. Uh, some people think that this is a recipe for gridlock. You're not going to get any decisions taken at all. Sometimes it is, but most of the time it works really well because people understand they have the maturity on that if we don't kind of uh, if you're not reasonable uh, then nothing is ever gets done uh, so it tends to work out uh. so democracy is one of the aspects the other aspect uh, uh, which is so important for the Vinaya is uh, the idea of decentralization every monastery is fully in charge of its own affairs uh, and this was laid down by the Buddha the idea of a sima sima is a boundary uh, and all decisions that are made are made according to these boundaries uh, so whatever monks live within a certain kind of area, they are fully independent in the decision making. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so this creates a very decentralized structure. It means that there are, no, in theory, there are no hierarchies. Only in theory, in practice, there are hierarchies, of course, but in theory, no hierarchies. Uh, and I think, personally, hierarchies, I think, are really bad. Yeah. The problem with hierarchies is tend to lead to corruption. Yeah. Yeah, if you have hierarchies, everybody wants to climb the hierarchy because hierarchy give you, gives you power, it gives you status, it gives you all these kind of things. When you have power instead, you can get things done in your way. Yeah. So everybody wants to climb the hierarchy. It's inherently uh, corrupt, corruptive. Yeah. Decentralized structure can much, much less likely to be corrupted yeah, precisely because there is nowhere, there's nowhere to go. All you're doing is making decisions again and go back to your cutie and kind of uh, you know, meditating or whatever. Yeah. So it's inherently less uh, ability to corrupt. Yeah. Yes, it means that there is no one on top to make sure everyone behaves properly, uh, but, uh, but that's okay. It means that some monasteries will be bad, some monasteries will be, will be good, uh, Then it's up to the lay people to then support those monasteries that are better uh, and not so much those that are bad. Yeah? Uh, so that kind of tends to work its way out anyway. Uh, the idea of using a hierarchy to control the monastic order, to kick out the bad ones and keep the good ones in there, uh, I think it defeats the purpose and makes the matter worse. It makes it more corrupt uh, because that's the nature of hierarchy. So. so it almost seems like Sangha is the anarchist uh, <laughs> movement. Yeah, in, in, in a sense, uh, that's, that's true. Yeah, I, I must admit, I don't really know exactly much about the theory of anarchy. I, I, I know that there's a lot of theory behind that as well. I don't really know enough to be able to say whether, right. how much it resembles that, uh, but uh, quite possibly, yeah. 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 Um, so, Bante, Ajahn Brahm is not a tyrant because he <laughs> used to say that there are two rules. First rule is you listen to what the abbot says. Yeah. Second rule, you go if something's wrong, go back to the new rule number one. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, I think that's that's uh, that's a joke. <laughs> and uh, how much? There's always some truth to every joke. Yeah. No. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. That's terrible to say. I, I remember there was one uh, there was one time with Ajahn Brown here, uh, you know, he, he is the spiritual director of the Buddhist Society of WA here. Uh, and you have to every year there's election for kind of the, the kind of the, the committee members of that that, uh, that you know the of the, of the BSWA here. Yeah. Everybody has to sign the paper what they are and assign the position. So Ajahn Brahm sign, signs Ajahn Brahm and then if it says underneath it writes spiritual dictator. <laughs> But somebody, somebody said, uh, is, did it, was this on purpose or was it a Freudian slip? <laughs> Maybe it was a, I don't know. But generally speaking, Ajahn Brahm is very, uh, he's very, he, he works on democratic ideas. Uh, and uh, in this monastery, it's not as if uh, Ajahn Brahm's kind of uh, ideas always win out. Sometimes, you know, if, he, if, he, if people disagree, then uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, 
And uh, I think that is, is great. There's a kind of a spiritual maturity to that and a kind of a sense of uh, confidence in that. I think the reason why you get a lot of control freaks uh, in, in position as abbots uh, is because of insecurity, basically. Yeah. They are afraid things are going to collapse, they're going to fall apart if we don't control things. Uh, uh, but if you have a lot of sec personal security, uh, you don't have that fear anymore, and you are able to let things go. Uh, and this is what I see with Ajahn Brahm. There's not, that insecurity is not there. Yeah. The basic qualities in a monastic should always be things like gentleness and kindness, you know? Uh, that should always be there. Uh, and if that is missing, then straight away you should have some kind of, you should have a little bit of, you shouldn't reject them straight away, but you should have a little bit of skepticism, perhaps, if that is the case. Uh, uh, there should also be a sense that um, they are renunciants, uh, yeah? that they have given up kind of the pleasures of the world. Uh, personally, I think monastics should also live in simple monasteries, uh, a bit like here at Bodhinana. If you look at the buildings here, it's not very impressive. Yeah? It looks like a kind of slightly run-down place. Uh, yeah? uh, it's, not, it's good. Uh, actually, it's quite nice around here, to be honest. Uh, but it does, it's, not, you know, it's, it's pretty average in many ways. Uh, and I think that's great. I love this place precisely because it is quite average. It's not really nice. And if monks live in environments, or nuns live in environments that are too beautiful, too expensive, supported by too much money, and all of these kind of things, uh, very often it is, uh, uh, it's not good. And if it hasn't been corrupted them yet, it kind of is heading in that direction towards corruption. So it should be simplicity, kindness, uh, and renunciation and kindness are two of the kind of main aspects of, uh, of monasticism.